15 minute or less lecture series anatomy and physiology chapter 8 muscular system part 1 the structure of a muscle organ the muscle organ is made up of bundles of bundles of bundles and bundles you have the muscle fibers these actual skeletal muscle cells that are bundled up together in a structure called a fascicle each muscle fiber is surrounded by its own sheet of connective tissue called the endomycium then you have the fascicles they bundle up to make the organ each individual fascicle is wrapped around by its own sheet of connective tissue called the paramycium and finally you have the muscle organ itself that is wrapped around by its own sheet of connective tissue called the epimycium these three layers of connective tissues eventually all fuse together to form the tendon that then attaches the muscle to the bone or other structures if you take a close-up look of the muscle fiber you see that it is filled with these long columns that of protein that are called myofibrils. And the myofibrils themselves are bundles of protein filaments. Here's a closer look of a muscle fiber. Turns out the cell membrane of a muscle fiber is called the sarcolemma. The cytoplasm of a muscle fiber is called the sarcoplasm. There is an invagination of the sarcolemma, basically a tunnel that passes through the width of the cell. This is called the transverse tubule. So it's a channel or tunnel passing through the cell, wrapping around the myofibrils. And then another structure that's special to muscle fibers is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, this uh, series of interconnected membranous structures that abut the transverse tubules and store calcium ions. If you take a close up look, you can see how the sarcoplasmic reticuli end up lying next to the transverse tubules. This arrangement is called a triad. If you look at the myofibrils themselves, they are made up of bundles of myofilaments, specifically thick filaments and thin filaments. The thick filaments are thicker and made up of the protein myosin, many, many myosin proteins. The thin filaments are thinner and have three different proteins, uh, long chains of actin protein, uh, some tropomyosin proteins, and these little blue ponin proteins that bind calcium. Uh, these thick and thin filaments get arranged in a structure called the sarcomere. The sarcomere has Z-discs at its end, connected to the next neighboring sarcomere. The thin filaments also attach to the Z-discs. And then there's an M-line in the middle, which is what the thick filaments are attached to. And this is a very important structure. You see that the sarcomeres are forming chunks of the myofibril. So you have sarcomeres here, and then here, and then here, and then here, all connected to each other, forming the myofibril itself. Also, this pattern of uh, less dense protein structures and more dense protein structures give us the striations we see when we look at skeletal muscle tissue underneath the microscope. Areas in the sarcomere that will have special names include the A-band. The A-band is where the thick filament is, the length of the thick filament. There's the H-zone. This area is where you only have thick filament. And then there are I-bands. I-bands are where you only have thin filament. When a muscle is fully relaxed, the sarcomere is as long as it's going to get. You can have a nice I-band, nice H-zones. However, as you contract, the thin filaments will get pulled toward the M-line. As they get pulled toward the end line, the sarcomeres will get shorter. The I bands and H zones will also get smaller. And then eventually, in a fully contracted muscle, you'll have the sarcomere becoming as short as it can possibly be, which is basically the size of the A band. And there will be no I bands and no H zones. All of the filaments will be overlapping with each other. How do we get a contraction in the muscles? Well, it all starts with the nervous system. A axon of a motor neuron will send a signal down to the neuromuscular junction where the synaptic knob of the axon is forming a connection with the muscle fiber. Taking a close-up look, here is the synaptic knob. It connects to a specific region of the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber called the motor end plate. At this connection, also known as synapse, the a uh, synaptic knob has vesicles filled with acetylcholine, and they will release their uh, chemicals, the acetylcholine, into the synaptic cleft, a slight space between the axon and the muscle fiber. The 
acetylcholine will then diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind to acetylcholine receptors found on the motor end plate. When that happens, uh, those receptors will open up channels, changing the charge at the motor end plate. If enough of these channels open, if enough acetylcholine binds, then this will reach the threshold stimulus. And this is the minimum needed to generate an impulse along the skeletal muscle cell membrane, also known as a muscle action potential. If a muscle action potential is generated, the charge will move along the sarcolemma and then eventually down into the transverse tubules. As it passes down in the transverse tubules, this change in charge will run next to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This triggers the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release its calcium ions into the sarcoplasm. <coughs> the calcium ions will then perform an important role at the level of the sarcomere. So remember, we have the thin filaments, the two regulatory proteins, the tropomyosin, which covers up myosin binding sites on the actin proteins, and the troponin, which contacts the tropomyosin and also possesses calcium binding sites. And then also in the thin filament is the actin proteins with the myosin binding sites. And then in the thick filament, we have the myosin, which has a, a the binding site that can bind and can bind to the actin and cause the movement. So actin and myosin are the motor proteins, tropomyosin and troponin are the regulatory proteins. So calcium is released by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. They bind to the troponin. Troponin changes its shape, moving the tropomyosin. Now the binding sites on the actin are exposed. So myosin will be able to bind to actin. Myosin does so. It binds to the binding sites on the actin molecule, forming a physical connection between the thick and thin filaments called the cross bridge. The myosin will then swivel its heads toward the M line. This will move the thin filaments toward the M line, shortening the sarcomere by a tiny amount. This is called the power stroke. During this process, the myosin will also release the ADP and phosphate attached to it. The myosin will then release the thin filaments only when bound to ATP. So if ATP binds to the myosin protein, then it will release the actin proteins of the thin filament. Then the myosin proteins will break down the ATP into ADP and phosphate. This will then allow the myosin to reset so it's ready to do another power stroke. And then if there's not enough ATP or the calcium concentration goes down a lot, then that will stop. There'll be no more contraction cycle. However, if there's still plenty of ATP and plenty of calcium ions, then the contraction cycle will continue, going around and around again, shortening the sarcomere until it is completely contracted. Turns out muscle fibers need oxygen to make energy via aerobic respiration. As we know, the oxygen from aerobic respiration allows us to generate 34 to 36 total ATP molecules, which is very important. The muscle fibers get oxygen from the hemoglobin in the blood. And then the muscle fibers also store oxygen in the form of on myoglobin. Myoglobin is a specialized protein found in the sarcoplasm of the muscle fiber that binds oxygen. Should the muscle fiber be in strenuous activity for a really long time, it may run out of oxygen. If this occurs, then it'll produce energy by the only way left, by fermentation. It will break down glucose to form pyruvic acid, which gets turned into lactic acid, and also produce 2 ATP, which is much, much less efficient. Eventually, the lactic acid will go into the bloodstream, return to the liver, to be converted back into glucose. Muscle fatigue, things that make our muscles tire out. Well, this occurs after or during strenuous activities. One possibility for fatigue is because the electrolyte balances are out of balance and haven't had the ability to return to their normal balance because just not enough time has passed to allow that to happen. Or it could be very low levels of ATP, perhaps because of having to go into fermentation mode. A muscle cramp occurs when there's a lack of ATP to return the calcium ions back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum which prevents the muscle from being able to relax. It can't relax, it just stays cramped even when we don't want it. Muscles 
are important also because when they contract, they produce heat. About, I think something like 60% of body heat comes from muscular contractions, and the rest come from cellular respiration, the generation of ATP. Muscle twitch, or muscles contracting. Here is a myogram, which uh, measures the amount of force generated from a muscle fiber as it contracts over time. So, first thing that happens is threshold is reached. Once threshold is reached, there's a slight latent period. Um, after that, the, the muscle fiber will contract, generating a certain amount of force, and then relax. Again, you have to reach threshold for this to occur. You can cause a muscle fiber to contract repeatedly at its minimum amount of contraction by just triggering it, stimulating it over and over again. However, if you stimulate it once and then stimulate it the second time before it has completely relaxed, then the amount of force generated by that muscle fiber's contraction actually increases more and more. Eventually, you get what's called complete platonic contraction. This means the stimulus has happened rapidly enough, the muscle's having to contract again and again and again until eventually it is just one continuous maximum amount of contraction, the most force being generated until the muscle fatigues. With any muscle organ, the skeletal muscle fibers are all grouped together in what are called um, motor units. So some of the skeletal muscle fibers are controlled by one specific motor neuron, other skeletal muscle fibers are controlled by another motor neuron, and so on. So you have certain groups of muscle fibers that will work at the same time. And when a muscle needs to contract a little bit, only some motor units are activated, but if it needs to generate even more force, then the body will recruit additional motor units until finally you've recruited all of the motor units of your muscle and are generating as much force as you possibly can. Muscle tone. All of our muscles when we're awake are slightly contracted, just a little bit, just a few motor units that stay contracted. This is important uh, so we can have our muscles respond quickly when they need to and also for the posture of your body, whether it's good posture or bad posture. Skeletal muscle tissue. Attaches to bones and is consciously controlled as a voluntarily controlled uh, organ. Cells are long cylindrical cells that are heavily striated, as we can see here and here. They have many, many nucleuses per cell and are contract from nerve impulses. Cardiac muscle tissues are also uh, somewhat cylindrical. However, they are much shorter in length. Uh, sometimes they branch. They uh, have striations similar to skeletal muscle cells, and they have dense protein interactions between cells, where cells are connected together, called interpolated discs. Finally, cardiac muscle tissue does not need the brain to activate. It can activate involuntarily. It has autoresmithism. Smooth muscle tissue is small tapering cells with a single nucleus per cell. Uh, they are controlled involuntarily. We don't consciously think of them contracting. Uh, they're found in the hollow organs of the body, such as digestive tract, blood vessels, urinary bladder, and so forth, and they lack no striation. That's why they're smooth. Um, instead, they don't have the, the, the myofibrils. They have their um, thick and thin filaments arranged in a more dispersed pattern, where the thick and thin filaments attach to dense bodies that connect to the intermediate filaments, which then attack attached to the cell membrane, uh, which allows the muscles, smooth muscle cells to contract, but slowly generating less force. Some disorders of the muscular system, there's overuse, causing some minor tearing of muscular structures, usually heals without no problem. There's muscular dystrophy, a uh, series of disorders in which the muscles are destroyed and replaced by connective tissue. It is a, uh, Progressive disorder, first diagnosed during childhood, leading to people to need to use uh, electric wheelchairs. There's myofascial pain syndrome, where the inflammation of connective tissue of the muscle causes extreme pain from the lightest touch. And that is it for this lecture.